uh, in for a treat. Got it. We are in for a treat for more lessons coming from um, Steps to Christ. Let us recap just for one minute uh, where Dr. Papu taught us that um, nature and revelation, revelation being the word of God, they all testify um, of the love of God. And um, uh, he said, if there's one thing that is important is for us to recognize the need for Christ, recognize our need for Christ. And another step was that um, for you now, when you have recognized your need for Christ, you need to come to him and repent. And there is repentance. And then there's true repentance. True repentance would mean that you are sorrowing for your sin. You remember David when he was, um, uh, uh, David in chapter 51, I want to believe, um, where, he, where he said that create in me a new heart, O God, and um, renew a steadfast spirit in me, sorrowing for your sin, rather than being afraid of the consequences of your sin. We are in for a treat, Dr. Papu. Please take over now um, with some more lessons. But before you do that, I just forgot one thing. On Fridays, I need to announce this on Fridays, 7 p.m., there is the prayers for those who are suffering from cancer. We are encouraged that we should send our names to our coordinators um, so that then those names can be prayed for on Fridays on this platform. Um, I bet you can join and I bet you can join also on Facebook. And uh, Dr. Papu, it is your time. Thank you, my sister, and 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 thank you very much. And good 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 morning to everyone. Be uh, you've done a beautiful recap of where we are, so I don't even need to get to that. Thank you very much. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, let me explain this before we go. We've covered three steps. We're going to focus on the next two steps. Now, let me say this: that the, these five steps, the two that I'm going to share with you, are very crucial. When we make a mistake here when we misstep these steps when we don't have this in this in, in these steps the next part the next steps won't make any sense because that's what it is to be a christian because this is the building this is what really uh introduces us to the the journey of christianity and if we miss the five steps and by the way you will realize that one of the reasons why we don't grow in our christianity when people struggle to grow it is because there's something I miss in the in the five in one of the in the five steps. But usually, it's the first one. The moment you embrace a God who is cruel, when you fail to realize that God loves you, I'm not talking about this cheap love. But God loves you. He sent His Son to die for you. Once you miss that, once you see God as a cruel God, a God who just wants to kill you a God who's always angry, a God who wants us to go to hell, a God who's um, making sure that we suffer. He doesn't want us to see happy. Now, there are two things you will do. You'll run away from that God, become an atheist or non-Christian, but that's, that's, that's better. But the worst one is when you accept that God, the moment you worship that God, I promise you, things go south. Number, number two, you will not be able to recognize your need for Christ. In other words, you won't see Christ as your savior. You will have to save yourself. You will actually focus yourself as your own savior. You won't even see the need of repentance because repentance, you remember, includes sorrow for sin and a turning away from it in the heart. There's, there's nothing like sin in the true sense. You cannot even see this, the sinfulness of sin. All you know is that God does not want us to, to, to commit this thing. I don't know. So you will always be trying. Uh, you still want to do it, but but you don't have the power. You don't have the, uh, you still have the appetite, ap ap appetite for it. Uh, but then, you know, then the Bible says you must not do it. And so you are, you are always clenching your, your fist and hoping that this thing will pass. It's so ugly. You may even go to church every day. You may go to church once a week. You may go to church and spend time in church, but there's no joy. The very presence of you in church, your, your very attendance is so bad itself. You wish we could go out. You wish we could leave. You wish, but you have to, because if you don't go there, God is going to kill you. I mean, you may even evangelize, but there's no joy. There's no happiness. You may even pray. But let me tell you something. The most painful is that when you miss that first step, you become more ugly than you were before you came to Christ. In other words, 
you, you keep worshiping a cruel God, you become like that God. So that people will say, when he was not a Christian, he was a nice person. But ever since he has become a Christian, hey man, the, the person is so cruel. The kids say, our father used to drink and he was nice, but now he's an elder, he's most cruel. So, so the moment you miss the first part, it's, it's, it's going south all the way. It, you, can't, you can't appreciate who Christ is. Um, you can't appreciate what repentance is. And, and so these steps are important. But remember, these steps as well, it's not something that um, I know the love of Christ and I move on. You keep, I mean, reading about that love. You keep deepening your understanding of the love of God. And the more you see that love, the more you grow. And the more you grow, the more you see the sinfulness of sin. The more you see, sense your need of Christ. And the more you repent, it deepens your repentance. So it's a process. It's a process, as my sister has, has indicated. Now, what the devil wants to do um, is he wants to shame us. So we become Christians who he wants to shame us. He wants to, to feel condemned, us to feel condemned. He, instead of us feeling guilty, we feel the shame. We say, I'm so hopeless. I'm, I'm so useless. And that's what the devil wants us to do. But remember what we said. Yes, when he points that we are sinners, when he points that we have, we have, we have, we have, we have sinned against God, we, yes, that is true, but we are not hopeless. We are not useless. Christ came to die for us and we confess and repent. All right, let's go to our, to our next two steps. Uh, that's going to make it five for now. Then the next the step number four is confession. And Proverbs 28, 13 kicks the start our chapter. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsake them shall have mercy. That's very important. The confessing and the forsaking. But remember that there is no confession without repentance. It is because we have seen the sinfulness of sin that you are confessing. You are not confessing to, to, to run away from, from consequence management. You are confessing because we have seen the sinfulness of sin. Those two go hand in hand. But the beautiful thing about confession in the Christian um, life, in the Bible, is that it, uh, it, 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 is, a, it, it, it is a condition for obtaining mercy of God. But the beautiful thing is that God does not require us, as Elijah puts it, to do some grievous thing in order that we may be forgiveness, we may be forgiven. We don't have to do pain, painful and, and perform painful penances. And we don't have to do things that will commend us, commend the soul to God. We don't have to uh, in expiate, uh, uh, um, uh, try to get rid of our transgression on our own and do all kinds of things. And, and no, 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 no. The Bible doesn't, the, the, the confession in the Bible is simple, but I said simple, I didn't say easy. It is simple, it is just, and it is reasonable. You confess, because now you say, look, and when you confess your sins to God, and you confess um, who can forgive you, you confess your faults to one another, but you confess your sins to God. Now that confession is of specific character. It acknowledges particular sins. So your confession is not general. Lord, forgive us our sins, but we have no clue what that is. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but when you confess, you are specific. This is where I've made it. Because remember, it's the Holy Spirit that actually helps you to see your sin as it is, ugly as it is, sinful as it is. And you throw yourself at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I have committed this particular sin. This is guilt, not shame. I'm coming to you because you love me. I'm coming to you because you said I must come to you and bring my burdens to you. I am coming to you because you are my father. You died. You sent your son to die for me. So that sin is, 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 is particular. Now, I know there are some people who would say, especially young people, okay, uh, including the adults, of course, uh, well, I can sin today, then I'll confess to what the pastor. The Bible says, if we confess, the Bible says, if we confess, the Lord will forgive us. That is very true. Um, so I can commit sin today. But the problem with that, you think, you think, remember, confession follows repentance. Now, how do you know that you will repent next week? Because repentance is not engineered. You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't create repentance. Repentance is brought about by the Holy Spirit. So how do you know that you will repent next week? How do you know? If you will repent next week, what prevents you from repenting now? But listen to this quotation here um, from, this, from, from our book. When sin has deadened the moral perceptions, the wrongdoer does not discern the defects of his character, nor realize the enormity of the evil he has committed. 
it, the Holy Spirit has to help you to get to that point. So unless you yield to the conv convicting power of the Holy Spirit, um, you remain in partial blindness to your sin and your confessions are not sincere and earnest. So you can't say, I will confess next week. I will repent next week. Because um, confession is produced by genuine repentance. Now, how will you, how do you know that you will, you the Holy Spirit will help you to see your sin if you don't see it now? The, and here's another important part in, in, in confession before we, we move on to consecration. There is no self-justification in true confession. You don't present an excuse. You don't say, Lord, I committed this sin, but they made me angry. Lord, I did this, but I was hungry. Lord, I did this, but you know I'm unemployed. Lord, I did this, but I was just angry. No, 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 no. There is no self-justification. There is no excuse. You confess because you agree with God that there was no reason for you to do that. Yes, we are sinners. Yes, it is not impossible for us to, to, uh, not to sin. You can't say, if you're a Christian, you can never sin, but it is not necessary. Yes, possible, but not necessary. And it is because of that that we confess and say, Lord, I was reckless. I was not focusing. I should not have done this. I know better. You confess your faults to one another. Bring your child and say, my child, daddy was wrong. Daddy should not have said that. What daddy said was wrong. My wife, my husband, what I said was wrong. Don't say, but you made me angry. But there's no self-justification. And here we end with this thing. First John 1. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our, if we confess, not if we pretend as if we are confessing, if we confess, because remember that confession, there's, there's repentance there, there's, there's, there's also reform there, You're, it's not just confessing in order to, um, to placate an angry God, then it takes you back to step number one, you don't even know who this God is, all right? That's, that's confession. Go read the book. There's so much in the book about, about confession. Now we come to consecration. And I thank uh, our, our, our uh, Elder Thierry for the songs he, he played there on consecrating. Lord, I give my life. I give everything to you. Jeremiah 29, verse 32. You shall seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. Not just with part of your heart, with all your heart. Now here's the thing about consecration which is basically surrendering, giving everything that has the potential to separate us from God. We give that up. So there's a difference between confession and consecration. Confession, you're confessing your sin. You're putting your sin right there um, uh, in the presence of God. You say, Lord, I've done this. Now, consecration says, now, I did these things, but but God helps you to see that this is the reason why I did this. So I must actually now consecrate this very thing. In other words, I was I committed sin. Remember now, I'm talking to a Christian because I was careless in this, because I was spending more time watching TV, because I was spending more time on this, because I was uh, spending time with people who have bad influence. So when you consecrate, when you yield, when you surrender, you are surrounding all those things, all those aspects, all those elements that will make sin possible, easy, attractive uh, in your life. And remember, um, here's the very important statement that the warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. So fighting against self. So what we do therefore is to surrender ourselves and say, Lord, me, I just want to do your will. I want to do that which you want me to do. We need to surrender the very will to God which is a struggle. That's why I say it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. It is a struggle. The soul must submit to God, she says, before it can be renewed in holiness. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I bring my body under. He says, I make it my slave. Instead of me being enslaved by my body, I make my body my slave. Listen, if you enjoy eating right through, you eat like grazing throughout the day, the chances are you, 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 you find yourself moving away from Christ if now food is going to be your idol. So, so we surrender that. It's not easy. It's simple. Because that's what Christ said, uh, surrender. But it's not easy. So, but the Bible says in Luke 14, 33, whoever of you does not forsake all, all that he has cannot be my disciple. And so what do we surrender? The love of money, beloved. The love, not money. Money you can 
sacrifice, but the love of man. And that's the reason why we, 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 we give offering. That's the reason why we tithe. That's the reason why we help others so that we move away from the love of money. Yes, I work in order to have money so I can support my family, support those who I need. It is never for the love itself. It is this love of money. And Paul talks about that, that the love of money has made us to, 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 to have a shipwreck of our faith. We move away from God because of the love of money and love of money. End up not worshiping God. The desire for wealth, the desire for riches is the golden chain that binds many people to Satan. The, 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 this desire for reputation, the worldly honor, love of position. I'm reading a book uh, that was written by uh, ben Simanda, some of you would know him, and they were arrested in Angola there. And I'm saying this because it's out there in the book. And, and in part of this very intricate story is that there was someone who was a member, a leader in the church, and, and he was not re-elected to the position. And then he started cooking up all those stories to a point where people were arrested, spent time in jail because of somebody who loves worldly honor. Now, when you when you are possessed with worldly honor, love of positions and reputation, I promise you, you'll find yourself doing things. You'll even get yourself involved in witchcraft because of the your love of reputation and worldly honor. Now, you see, the worldly honor doesn't look like sin, but it will lead you and separate you from Christ. The love, the love of selfish ease, love of freedom from responsibility is the idol of many others. These must be broken, she says. Um, and some of these things that you need to break are your friends. Your friends may actually prevent you from growing. So you might be saying today, but this is too much. I'm yielding everything. Um, my friends, uh, uh, my, my uh, time with, with, with social media, I'm always, uh, uh, I can't now do this. It's too much. I'm surrendering too much. I'm yielding too much to Christ. But beloved, if you value your salvation, if you value and you appreciate the love of God, that cannot be. And she asked the question, if you give that up, if you give a sinful, polluted heart, what are you giving up? You, you, you're giving this heart to be purified, to be cleansed by the, the blood of Jesus, um, and to be saved by his matchless love, and yet you think it is hard. If you think it is hard to give up um, time that you spend uh, watching programs that have nothing to do with your enrichment, is, 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 is that hard to a point where you think you are sacrificing? You, you sacrifice that which is actually killing you. When, 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 when God says, uh, give up this, he does it for our interest, beloved. God does not want to see us happy. God is not pleased to see his children suffer. Heaven is interested in the happiness of man. God, can, that's what you see Christ doing um, early on in his ministry, serving, ministering to the happiness of men, changing water into wine at a wedding. God wants us to be happy. There are people who say, no, I, we must not be happy. Uh, uh, we must always be miserable because, because we are going to heaven. God, it is not sinful to be happy. So what God is doing is to remove those things that will ultimately make us very unhappy. God wants us to experience heaven here on our way to heaven. He wants us to experience Canaan here through the wilderness. He requires us to perform only those duties that will lead our steps to heights of bliss and contentment and that disobedient can never attain. Yes, we've been given the power of choice, beloved, as we end. It is ours to exercise, she says. We cannot change our hearts. We cannot give ourselves to God for our affections, uh, but we can choose to serve him. We can give him our will. We can surrender. We have been given that choice. You can surrender. It may look like you're hopeless. You make promises you cannot keep, but you can surrender your will and say, Lord, please take my affections. Please, Lord, take me. And when you do that, God will work in you the desire to do his will. Here is our parting paragraph as we end. By yielding up your will to Christ, you ally yourself with the power that is above all principalities and powers. When you yield your will to Christ, you become, if, we, if I can say that, invincible. You become omnipotent. That's why Paul says, I can do all things. The moment you yield and you connect with Christ, there is no mountain that you cannot climb. You will have strength from above 
to hold you steadfast. And thus, through constant surrender to God, you will be enabled to live the new life, even the life of faith. The possible, the impossible will become possible. May God bless you. Let us pray together. Our kind and loving Father, we're looking at step four and five, confession and consecration. Some of us are stuck right there. And the reason we're stuck there, it is because the first step that you love us, is not very clear. Lord, when we see the sinfulness of sin, which is the result of genuine repentance, confession becomes logical. It becomes the, the most uh, consistent thing to do. And, and consecration as well, where we, we, we don't want to see ourselves in this mess. We know the pain. We know what sin does to us. We know what sin has, has done to my family, to my children, to those around me. And therefore, Lord, we, by the, your grace and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we yield those things that will create that toxic environment that will lead us to a point where we commit sin. We love you, dear God, and we thank you. And we pray that you will continue to show us your love, that we may embrace you and give everything to you and surrender all that we may be able to enjoy freedom in the true sense of the word. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Mfundisi.